Good evening, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. Delighted to be with you tonight in my most favorite hall. Unfortunately, you are not here, but when I close my eyes, I imagine you being with us. Let's hope that these times will pass and we can continue playing for an audience here, as we have been doing in the past. An all Bach program, you don't have to ask me why, because uh, over and over again I say that to me, by far the greatest composer who, have, who has ever lived is Johann Sebastian Bach. And one doesn't have to prove that. Those who disagree, they don't have to listen. <laughs> to begin the Capriccio in B-flat major, an early work from the teenager Bach, we know very few pieces of his from this period. He was 18 or 19 years old when he wrote it. And it tells a story. This is program music. He had his predecessors here, for example, Kunau, with his biblical sonatas. Short movements, and each movement has a little title. Uh, for example, the first one, which starts like this. Uh, The friends are complimenting the beloved brother. Uh, the story is that he has been called to leave Germany and join the court of the Swedish king to become a court musician. So the friends are trying to tell him to please don't go away, stay here at home. It's safer here. The next movement already is depicting the dangers of this journey. So it's a conversation piece. Each person adds to the conversation, saying, oh, don't catch cold, or be careful with the luggage, or be, be careful with the robbers on the road, etc. Traveling has always been a dangerous undertaking. And then comes like a passacaglia. Yeah. On a lamenting bass and uh, variations. Uh, this is the lamentation of the friends. Then they they accept the fact that he is leaving and they say goodbye to him. Auf Wiedersehen, auf Wiedersehen, goodbye. And then comes a wonderful little piece, the aria of the coachman. And listen to this motif. This could be the post horn, but to me this is the horse. So we have a very musical coachman and an even more musical horse who contributes to the, to the music. And the work ends with a jolly fugue. of dactyls and this imitating the sound of the post horn and also uh, with little calls from the horse. So please listen to Bach's capriccio on the departure of his most beloved brother.
this was the Capriccio, Bon Voyage, and we skip 20 years now, and you will hear now two of the symphonias, or three-part inventions, written in the 1720s in the city of Köthen. This shows another side of Bach, Bach the teacher, the pedagogue, but on the very highest level. For his many children, and especially for the first two, Wilhelm Friedemann Bach and Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach, who were highly gifted and musical, he wrote the two and three part inventions for the sake of education, not just to play keyboard instruments, but to give them good taste in composition, in ornamentation, in figure-based playing, to control the independent voices. And this is very beautiful in his preface to the inventions. Bach emphasizes the importance of the cantabile, the singing way of playing the keyboard instrument. And this is a lesson to us all. The piano should never be a percussive instrument. It's a singing instrument. If you hit the piano, it hits back. So two three-part inventions, E-flat major, and then the greatest of all of them, the F minor.
This F minor symphonia is one of the greatest works of Johann Sebastian Bach and by anybody. And how Bach can say so much with so few notes in just over two minutes, you have almost all of the Saint Matthew passion here. From the same period, mid 1720s, comes one of Bach's most celebrated and famous compositions, the Chromatic Fantasy and Fugue. Already in his lifetime, this work has achieved great popularity, according to Bach's first biographer, Forkel. He writes in 1802 that all of Germany and indeed all of Europe knew this piece and this established Bach as one of the major composers of the time. Fantasy is a free improvisation, however, it is very, very well organized. And after that, the fugue is strict and severe, but with certain licenses. So, as Pablo Casals beautifully said, freedom, but with order.
Chromatic Fantasy and Fugue. Thank you for listening. We move forward again. Bach was born in Eisenach, 1685, the same year as Handel and Domenico Scarlatti. It was a very good vintage. And he died in Leipzig, 65 years of age, in 1750. The next two pieces belong together. They are the second part of the Klavierübung, the keyboard exercise. And Bach was not just the greatest composer, he was a great encyclopedist and a great scientist. So he looked at each genre of composition and took that to perfection and beyond. These two works are the Italian Concerto and the French Ouverture, written for a harpsichord with two manuals, so I am playing it on the wrong instrument. I apologize. However, the music is so great that it transcends the limitations of, of instruments. And every single instrument has its limitations, also the modern piano. We try to overcome that by making illusions. Illusion of a legato, illusion of sustaining a note, etc. What is special about these two works? First, I would like to say that Bach is a German composer, but he is not at all nationalistic. Nowhere in his works do we read the word Deutsch, German. He is he's a European, he is an international composer. Here he writes a concerto in the Italian style and the French Ouverture. In the French Ouverture we find French, German, Spanish, Scottish dances. So we have the perfect example of Europe and let's never forget that. We should be very proud of that. Here in London, in this wonderful hall and played by my humble person, a Hungarian Jew. So here we have the Italian concerto modeled on Vivaldi, Corelli, Albinoni and other Italian masters. But for a concerto you need an orchestra and a soloist or a group of soloists. And Bach manages the miracle of creating the illusion of an orchestra and solo, a group of soloists, so Concerto Grosso and Concertino or Concerto Piccolo. Three movements. The first movement has no tempo indication. The second one is Andante. Andante doesn't mean slow, but it means at a walking space, andare in Italian. And you have an ostinato here. This ostinato, this is like a heartbeat. If I may tell you the story when the Hungarian goes to the cardiologist and he gets examined and the cardiologist says, excuse me, but are you Hungarian? And he says, how did you know? Because your heart beats tick-tock, tick-tock. So this is an Italian heartbeat. And the last movement is a jolly, cheerful, wonderfully exuberant presto.
Concerto, and now comes its brother or sister, the French Ouverture. It's a huge work in 11 movements. Uh, it pays homage to the French composers Lully, Couperin, and Ramon, and especially the first movement, which is the French Ouverture, with its very festive dotted rhythms, so um, like that. And each section is to be repeated. I'm not being dogmatic, but I think if a composer wrote a repeat, it's not for us mere performers to know better. It's also, it gives us a second chance, like, like in tennis, a second service, to play it a little better. We'll play it differently, show it in different light, different ornamentation, different articulation. Um, so after this very festive opening, there comes a fugato. And also here, like in the Italian concerto, we have 
the orchestral sections and the solo sections interchanging. After that, we get down to the galanteries, the, the dances. First, a French courant. Then a pair of gavottes. And gavotte always begins with two crotchet upbeat so then a pair of passepieds a passepied is like a very fast minuet and the second one is very beautiful in b major peaceful music, very gentle. Then comes the centerpiece of this overture, the Sarabande. The Sarabande is, is a very solemn Spanish dance, which was banned by the Spanish court in the later years of the Inquisition because of its very erotic nature. Uh, I don't find anything particularly erotic about this, but Wonderful polyphonic piece. And then a pair of bourrées, very lively, fiery dance. Then we come to the jig, which is Irish or Scottish, but certainly nearer to our waters. Very bouncy a sailor's dance, and usually a suite or a partita would end with the jig, but Bach makes an exception here and adds a final movement titled Echo. I don't know of another echo in Bach's oeuvre, certainly in other music or certainly in nature, but this is a very humorous touch because you hear Again, on one instrument, he creates the illusion of an echo. Please listen to the French overture. <laughs> 